Um, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which time zone it is in which you're joining us. Uh, and welcome to panel six on opportunities for global governance. And it is my pleasure to introduce your chair for this session. After completing a part-time master's and a full-time PhD at Wolfson College in Cambridge, Dr. Jamie Trinidad became a fellow and tutor at Wolfson and a fellow of the Lauderpack Center for International Law. He has been a tutor for part-time students since 2014 and is the Director of Studies in Law at Wolfson. Dr. Trinidad studied law and international relations at university. He qualified at the Bar of England and Wales in 2001 as a member of Lincoln's Inn and the Bar of Gibraltar in 2005. He is a door tenant at Seven Bedford Row, London, and a consultant at Isolas, Gibraltar's oldest law firm. Dr. Trinidad's academic research focuses on international territorial disputes, self-determination, and human rights, and he has published widely in these areas. So without further ado, here is your chair. Thanks, Jameson, and uh, good morning and welcome to everyone to, uh, to what promises to be an extremely exciting and fascinating panel on opportunities for global governance. Um, just a couple of housekeeping matters before we, uh, before we start. Um, so two of our presenters, or two sets of presenters, are unfortunately unable to make. Um, that's the, the last two on the on the list. Um, so Professor Nguyen and uh, the presentation by Gayatri Venugopal and Ashish Jain Prakash. So unfortunately, they are unable to make it, but the, the plus side means we can afford to be a little more lax on the timekeeping front when it comes to individual presentations so um i'm assuming that if you're attending the panel you're interested enough to have read the the bios in advance so i'll dispense with sort of detailed introductions to the to our speakers and i'll simply sort of dive straight in but i'd ask them you know even though we have a bit more flexibility on timekeeping to keep their their comments to around sort of 17 minutes or so so that we can have plenty of time for discussion between the participants, but also from uh, the from the floor. So I, I welcome you, uh, participants, to to just drop questions and comments into the chat um, as we go along. Um, so then, without further ado, I'll I'll just ask uh, Dr. Alexandra Harrington, who's a lecturer in law at Lancaster University, uh, to to start with the first presentation. The topic of which is global governance and international law synergies in the face of emergency. Alexandra, please. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jamie, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Um, it is a Sunday morning and I know that wherever, well, in many places or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, but it is a Sunday regardless. So thank you for choosing to spend some of your time uh, with us. And before I begin, I would just like to give a very special, warm and a very deep Thank you to especially Jane and Tejas and Jameson for, for doing all the work to bring this conference together to fruition, you know, especially still in the midst of not knowing what's going on with pandemic uh, measures from one day to the, the next. It really has been um, a pleasure to work with you all and to just have this come about. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you again to the audience members, obviously, for, for turning out and hopefully asking a lot of great questions. Um, so the, the title of the presentation is rather broad, um, but the idea of the presentation and the paper is it, how do we take what we know of both rapid onset like COVID and also slow onset such as climate change and biodiversity emergencies and reconcile them within the frameworks of global governance and international law to see that these are not necessarily polar opposite fields, to see that they are not necessarily always going to be pulling um, apart or creating different pressures as many people argue global governance and international law sometimes do, but actually that they can be used together as, as drivers and as synergies um, to come up with reactions and that many of the negatives people tend to see in the relationship academics and also practitioners tend to see in relation to global governance and international law actually comes from the, um, the application and the state-based actions rather than the system itself. 
So if you've read the paper, perhaps that came through. If not, then we shall have to figure out how it didn't. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so when we think about global governance and we think about international law, we do tend to think of them in separate fields. And so we do tend, especially for those of us who are international lawyers, to think about international law as in some cases being amongst the oldest in the world, certainly in the context of diplomacy and trade um, and global governance being very new and global governance being something where we certainly think of it after World War II, perhaps some who are more generous will think of it after World War I, although obviously some of the very prominent examples such as the League of Nations did fail. Um, however, it is still very much a new player in the system that we have um, in the international community. So there is often this dichotomy of very old, and very new and how do we work together or how do they grow together? But one of the really core arguments of the paper and one of the core arguments that I always make in this discussion is that they may have started off differently in terms of time and temporal settings and they may have started off differently in terms of overall aims, but they have grown together so that global governance and international law since the end of World War II have really grown together um, in ways that create many strengths and that have obviously given us many institutions that we now have. Um, and that while there are dichotomies and there are areas where this relationship might be at the very least taxed, if not sometimes fall apart, it does actually exist. And that relationship often uh, is very positive as well as very negative, or at least offers the potential to do so, to be positive as well as negative. Um, and I think certainly while the paper did not try to touch a great deal on the issues coming from um, Ukraine and Russia right now, we do see this as well um, in that, and we could probably call have a debate as to whether or not we want to call that a rapid onset or um, a slow onset particular type of emergency, which may be a discussion for Q&A later on, or certainly I would be happy to engage on that um, after the, the presentation. But to give us a framework of kind of how did we get with a slow onset event or series of them, climate change and biodiversity, how did we get to March 2020 before everything changed for the vast majority of us um, with the very rapid onset of the pandemic? A reminder of what life was like back in the olden days of the pre-pandemic um, when COVID was not something that we spoke of all the time and um, when a corona was something that was in the astrological realm or in one's eye rather than um, anything in the <clears throat> more accepted publicly at least um, health literature and discussion. So in 2020, we were coming in March, we were coming as a reminder um, off the well, we'll talk about it in a minute, but off the Conference of the Parties, the COP25, um, that had happened in Madrid at the very last minute for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We were coming into what a year that we had anticipated having great growth in the UN Convention uh, system, Framework Convention system, and also in the Biological Diversity Convention system. And the origin of these two together, it must be reminded of all of our audience, many of you will probably be too young to remember, but um, it was 30 years before, it was nearly 30 years before in 1992. And in 1992 at Rio, we had the trio of Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and also the Convention on uh, Desertification and Drought, which addressed the major issues at the time in terms of international environmental law and really created a great deal of what we know to be international environmental law and the global governance regimes around it. And from this came a number of different conceptions of how to regulate and how international law and global governance would emerge to address something that we knew to be a relatively slow onset at the time, uh, scientifically at least, if not event uh, series of events. So changes to 
the climate changes to biological diversity were understood to be things that would happen over time. They would need special regulation. They would need special legal frameworks and the ability of global governance mechanisms to adapt to whatever these frameworks might be. Hence, we had um, the allowance in both conventions of protocols of amendments, of various new forms of growth and various new forms of legal uh, innovation as were necessary. And in both contexts for governance purposes, we saw international law creating very strong secretariat bodies, which were tasked and continue to be tasked with overseeing the operations of the treaty regime and enforcing the global governance regimes of the conferences of the parties, which are the majority um, decision-making bodies for both of these regimes. And over time, these really have become quite entrenched and are helping and continue to help even throughout the pandemic in efforts to address how we work on these issues for slow onset events, but still slightly different than as we'll talk about what happens with rapid onset events. So in March, to take you back to that time in early March, certainly not by this time in March 2020, because by this time we already knew what coronavirus was, we knew COVID was, and we were already in uh, a declared pandemic. But March 1st, 2020 um, was, as I mentioned, a time of excitement. It was the fifth, 2020 is the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement being adopted. We were looking forward to hopefully something very positive coming out of the COP26 scheduled for Glasgow. Um, the watershed year of 2015 was a new effort to create a treaty that was forward looking, that gave international law and global governance together tools to address what we now understood to be climate change what we now understood to be the social and economic and cultural impacts, as well as the environmental impacts. Um, and certainly it is, if you read it in comparison to the Kyoto Protocol or the Framework Convention itself, which I'm sure most of you have done, it really does convey a different spirit. Um, unfortunately, in 2016 and 17, the conferences of the parties didn't do a great deal to advance that spirit. In 2018, obviously we had Katowice and we had the outcomes from Katowice, which gave us a regulatory and governance document in many ways in the combined outcomes, um, which amplified what the governance tools would be to implement the laws, what things like nationally determined contributions, et cetera, would look like, and then how those would be put into place, as well as how the Paris Agreement uh, Compliance Committee would function and then how various types of financial tools and also transparency mechanism and technology transfer mechanisms would work. So we've really seen the, uh, the governance mechanism of the COPs being used to then translate the international law into practice and nuts and bolts practice on the ground in many ways. Um, 2019 was supposed to be something that was quite again, revolutionary was supposed to give us much more of a sense of what the social outcomes were, how we were going to address the social issues involves. However, um, many of you will recall that while the Chilean presidency did truly fantastic work in the months leading up to the Conference of the Parties itself, it was faced with a very rapid onset emergency of um, in October 2019, having domestic um, problems, domestic issues come to the forefront, become very violent, um, ultimately be the drivers for their own constitutional reform, which is going on now. But as a result, causing the Chilean presidency not to be able to host the COP and instead being moved very graciously to Madrid. Um, when that happened, we saw a great kind of step back in expectation. And we saw how external impacts such as problems in the host country, um, such as the framing of questions by the new host country moving forward, really have an impact on the, uh, the global governance system and the international law coming out of it for any of the conference of the parties that are, um, are used. So there was this great deal of hope that you know, we were going to have a, a COP in, in 2020 that would be very much an advancement and on the five year anniversary, we would have a great deal to give in what was the latest evolution over a 30 year time period to address the same type of issue, albeit one that has unfolded quite differently. 
many of the um, the issues that have also been raised in climate change have been raised in biological diversity and biodiversity again was something where 2020 uh, because the conference is biennial be uh, rather than every year annual there was a great deal of interest and excitement coming into it for the CBD because May 2020 was meant to be the uh, COP15 in Kunming in China and this was supposed to be the year where we saw the latest iteration of multi-year planning, which has been the system um, adopted in a bit more of an informal context in CBD to phase out the Aichi targets and then come up with a new set of targets for implementing the legal obligations in a global governance system. Um, we'd seen the zero draft, we'd seen state parties coming together and discussing, but we didn't have any idea yet. And the hope was by May, we would have a great deal of ideas what this next document would look like and how it would function. Um, and then everything changed and it changed quite quickly and it changed quite dramatically. And there was at first hope that perhaps by the time we get, if not to May in Kunming, if we can push it back to perhaps October, then certainly by the time we get to COP uh, for the Framework Convention on Climate Change, we'll be able to come together again and obviously that didn't happen um, but we stood facing this precipice of of the pandemic facing very slow onset events in a way that saw global governance and international law working very well together to reinforce each other in many ways but we saw that um there was a struggle to use scientific knowledge and technical knowledge, which informed a lot of the debates going on in the global governance tools and a lot of the efforts in the international law community in a way that would be meaningful and that would be palatable for national actors and subnational actors at home and in their daily lives, as well as to achieve the goals of climate change regulation and biodiversity regulation. Uh, we think of this, especially in the idea of climate science skepticism or denial of climate change itself, and then denial of the impacts of biodiversity um, destruction. And this is a very interesting dichotomy. It's a very ironic dichotomy in the sense that we already had climate science skepticism and questioning and we had an understanding of science as perhaps something that in many sectors wasn't as real as it should be a governing tool or for a governing tool. And then we had the pandemic start. And we had a preset theoretically very strong as opposed to an evolving system in climate change and biodiversity. We had a very strong theoretical system in place under the WHO to govern and put in place international law requirements. Um, for how to handle outbreaks that then become larger issues that then become ultimately pandemics in the, the shape of the international health regulations and the, the latest issue of them or latest variant of them. Um, they did provide a very kind of clear series of steps and understandings of those steps and how they work. And theoretically, they were supposed to work quite well and they did work quite well in the beginning. Um, however, what we saw emerge in a response to something very rapid was this issue of sovereignty and this tension of sovereignty and the ability of the international both law and governance level uh, systems that we have created to respond when there are inherent, no matter how globalized we might think of ourselves, inherent sovereignty issues at home that are also built into that system. So. There is an IHR uh, discussion on and provision on how to have um, the least restrictive measures on travel, border closures, et cetera, in a pandemic. And yet what we are perhaps most familiar with in the, the context of COVID restrictions is the idea of a lockdown, the idea of closing borders, placing travel restrictions, because this is where the national response went quite quickly, although there have been a number of calls from the WHO for this not to happen. Um, and so we see now coming out of the pandemic, now that we are starting to process whatever we view life as post-pandemic uh, normal to be, calls for the IHRs to be addressed, 
to be rewritten. We are also seeing calls for a new treaty that will perhaps uh, specifically relate to pandemics. So not just as a set of regulations, but as a treaty requirement um, that will change pandemic governance as well as pandemic law. And so the World Health uh, Organization's World Health Assembly in 2021, at the very end of 2021, said that it wants to, to have this as a formalized process and started this type of negotiation as a process. But we don't necessarily know how to frame global governance and international law in a way that will allow for the balance with sovereignty that would be necessary for many of the types of responses that certainly individual citizens, as well as various political actors, have always wanted in this pandemic, which is a much more concerted international organized focus, um, not only in response to travel restrictions, et cetera, but also in response to economic pressures um, and issues such as vaccine equity, vaccine access, um, medication access, et cetera and food access where we've seen a number of problems emerging. So I'm conscious that I don't want to go over time and I'm sure that I'm probably getting quite close. Um, but it, if you look through the paper and you look through the rest of the discussion on the types of issues that have come out, you will see that many of them are at heart really quite reflective of this tension between global governance and international law in a rapid onset. Um, trying to take what we know of science and what we know of regulatory capacity and balance it off against state sovereignty. And in many ways, that's actually what we see in the slow onset emergency as well. Um, but it just has a longer period of time to marinate. It has a longer period of time for sides to form and also to then try to bridge together and work together because obviously the response is a bit different in timing. Um, but this should not, ultimately, the argument of the paper is, this should not be seen as a weakness. This is a reality. It is something that we have to be aware of. It's something that we really do need to discuss. And issues of sovereignty and statehood obviously have come to the fore, not only post-pandemic, but also now with the discussions about um, Ukraine and Russia and what it means to respect sovereignty and what it means to protect sovereignty and sovereign borders, et cetera, and what we expect from international law. And so when we have the discussion of international law in this context, we need to bring global governance with it. We need to have them emerge together as they have been in response to many different types of emergencies. Um, but we do need to keep them together. We need to highlight the synergies that come from them and the ways that they have expanded together and what they can offer in the future and address some of the underlying issues that really inform many of the critiques of global governance and international law together. Um, because those are the real core, whether we're talking about climate change and slow onset or COVID and rapid onset emergencies, those are really where the core tensions lie and they are very much similar. They're just named different things or they're presented slightly differently. So I am happy to yield the floor back to our interpret chair and say thank you very much, um, Jamie. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for those insights. Um, and I'll, I'll pass straight away now to uh, Elias Ioannou, who is a PhD candidate at Queen Mary University of London, and whose topic is relational networks in international trade platforms. Thank you so much, Dr. Trinidad, for introducing me. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, deeply grateful and it is a great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to present my working paper in this uh, magnificent conference. Um, let me start by uh, sharing my screen. So is uh, my, my screen looking uh, all right? Good. So. Uh, my paper is entitled Relational Networks and International Trade Platforms. By international trade platforms, I refer to business to business digital platforms aiming. Uh, so it, my presentation is in the field of international trade. Uh, by international trade platforms, I refer to business to business digital platforms aiming to facilitate uh, communications and transactions among the multitude of actors involved in international trade, including merchants, ocean carriers, and logistics providers financiers, insurers, and custom authorities. So the 
message of my uh, presentation is basically fourfold. First, uh, with respect to the current debate, um, also among legal scholars, as to whether blockchain technology is a useful technology for lawful activities, or it is rather a, a bubble and a dumped squib, as it has been characterized. The paper presents evidence that uh, there are indeed meaningful non-currency applications of blockchain technology in the realm of international trade. Second, the paper argues that blockchain-based international trade platforms are governed primarily by traditional mechanisms, specifically contracts and choice of law clauses in the form of platform rule books. Third, empirical insights suggest that English law tends to be chosen by commercial parties as applicable law to govern their relationship uh, in, in uh, these platforms, rendering English law quasi-international in such relations. As things stand, however, uh, these mechanisms are inadequate to incentivize digitalization because uh, they do not provide enough predictability, which is so important in international trade. Finally, two solutions are examined. First, to interpret platform rule books as relational contracts. And second, whether to assess whether rule books should be designed as relational by their drafters. The paper concludes that by designing platform rule books as relational contracts, uh, this can provide an effective uh, principle-based governance mechanism for international trade platforms, thereby uh, facilitating uh, digital adoption. Now let's move on to the motivation. So uh, why is this important? First, one of the main functions of these platforms is to digitalize certain trade documents which have not been able to be digitalized hitherto due to the fact uh, that they need to be unique. Uh, so international trade platforms harness the potential of blockchain to digitalize transport documents of title. Second, there are palpable economic benefits with digitalization of trade documents. According to the International Chamber of Commerce, for example, digitalizing bills of lading, that is one of the most important uh, documents in international trade, uh, will free up to 171 billion pounds uh, in efficiency gains in the UK alone and digitalization will have ripple effects across the society, as it is not a secret that uh, high shipping rates contribute to high inflation. However, in 2020, only 0.1% of all bill of ladings were issued electronically, which uh, suggests that 99.9% .9 are still in paper form. So why is that? What are the key issues preventing the development and use of blockchain uh, alternatives operating on global trade platforms? Well, the starting point of my presentation and of my paper is that there are both legal and governance issues. The absence of a legal recognition of digital documents of title across jurisdiction requires legislative intervention at the national level. For example, the Law Commission of England and Wales published last week its consultation paper and electronic trade documents bill in an attempt to address this issue and modernize English law. These documents are used across jurisdictions to support cross-border trade. Therefore, the legislative response needs to be aligned internationally. There are also contractual workarounds uh, in the form of platform rule books to fill in the gaps in the absence of suitable legislation uh, to enable uh, the recognition of digital trade documents across jurisdiction. However, extant research has also identified that cooperation between competitors is also required to promote digitalization at an industry level. This is what has been termed by uh, commentators as a competition paradox. Uh, this calls for an effective governance mechanism of such platforms if they are to be adopted after all. So we have both legal and governance issues. Uh, my working paper focuses on uh, the governance issues. So the research question, uh, were set as uh, first to explore how are blockchain platforms in international trade governed, second to assess if these governance mechanisms are suitable to uh, manage contingencies effectively and facilitate uh, digitalization, and third to propose how could governance be improved to encourage adoption. To answer this question, uh, the methodology involves uh, a case study examining specific international trade platforms terms and condition in the container shipping industry. Second, the theoretical analysis, drawing upon the principles of law and economics to assess if these governance mechanisms are suitable. And third, a doctrinal analysis of a typology of contracts to identify what type of contract rule books constitute and how they could be improved. 
this is where the case study comes into play. So uh, the table here presents the most widely adopted platforms in commercial use in the container shipping sector. As we can uh, see, there are seven accredited systems, five of those blockchain-based. So the technology is in column three. Um, if we look at the fourth column, we will see that all international trade platforms are supplied by a provider that is either a company or in the case of trade lens, that is number six by a joint venture. The legal framework underpinning these platforms is a multilateral contractual agreement. In the fifth column, we can see approved platform rule books that govern the operation of each platform. Publicly available versions of uh, some of those uh, rule books constitute the units of analysis of my working paper and reveal that the governance mechanism of each platform uh, is prescribed in these rule books. Specifically, parties to the rule book agree to treat uh, electronic records within the system as the functional and legal equivalent of paper documents and undertake not to challenge the validity of any transaction made on the ground that it was made in electronic form instead of in paper form. Choice of log logics are also contained therein, as we can clearly see in the final uh, column. Um, most platforms choose English law as applicable substantive law governing the relationship of the parties involved, rendering English law quasi international in such relations. So, how um, are blockchain platforms in international trade governed? Well, my findings suggest that they are governed primarily by contractual mechanisms. As we saw in the previous slide in the case study, uh, international trade platforms follow a common modular architecture composed of a platform provider in the form of a company or of a joint venture and of the various types of platform members. Therefore, these platforms are not completely decentralized as it is often called in the blockchain sphere, but they are offered as a service. Access to the platform is controlled by the platform provider and to join members agree to the rules set by the platform rule book. Sorry. Um, so uh, the rule book, uh, the rule books provide the governance mechanism that regulates the relationship on the one hand between the platform provider and the various types of platform members, and on the other hand, the relationship between the platform members among themselves. So the question becomes what type of contract these rule books constitute. And the findings suggest that platform rule books resemble network contracts. These are multi-partite agreements involving many independent yet interdependent business actors or contracts, which are somehow connected with each other. The theoretical analysis revealed three main limitations associated with governance through contracts. First, incomplete contracts entail high levels of uncertainty. Incomplete contracts come from contract theory and suggest that contracts cannot provide clauses for all contingencies that may affect an agreement's future course. Parties cannot provide exact clauses for all possible events that may affect the relationship in the future. And the interdependency in our context, the interdependency of, uh, of agents in these rule books and the innovative nature of blockchain platforms entail very high uncertainties about the future of the relationship at the point platform members enter into the agreement uh, rule book. So that, that is the rule book. The second limitation is the risk of holdup. So the holdup uh, is the possibility that one party of a contract will obtain increased bargaining power uh, to extract profits at the expense of the other, for example, by unilaterally raising prices or introducing any other opportunistic contract term. This is a typical business strategy followed by consumer-facing digital platforms that we all use, such as Amazon, Uber, or Deliveroo. That is that they first subsidize um, participation to the platform and once they achieve network effects, uh, then they can use their increasing bargaining position to renegotiate the terms of use of these platforms. In our context, this is supported by the fact that platform providers have retained um, the right to make amendments to platform rule books so, uh, for instance, Cargo X rulebook states that, and I'm quoting, Cargo X may revise these standard terms and conditions at any time and will post any amendments on their website. Similar clauses have been found in the Trade Lens Network Member Agreement, the WAVE bylaws, and so on. 
A third limitation is the insufficient protection of relationship specific investments. So what are those? Those are investments which are not fully redeployable outside of the relation. So prospective members, platform members, such as shipping lines, um, face several investments when partnering with, an, uh, with a tech platform, making it expensive to unwind the relationship and start a new one with another platform. For example, they face uh, IT integration costs, uh, costs for training the personnel, and most importantly, costs for promoting one platform to their clients and to their networks. Ownership of the platform thus uh, develops as a source of bargaining power on behalf of the provider who can potentially renegotiate the agreement and benefit from more favorable terms once it has achieved network effects and its bargaining position has been strengthened. So um, are these rule books suitable to govern all aspects of participants' behavior within existing English law? And my answer is likely no. There is a need uh, for a legal solution where platform members can establish a mechanism to protect themselves from uncertainty, opportunistic behavior, and the risk of holdup. So how could governance be improved to encourage adoption? The working paper examines two approaches. First, construing platform rule books as relational contracts. And second, to uh, the contract design approach, that is whether rule books should be designed as relational by their drafters. So let's look at those two quickly. First, uh, construing platform rule books as relational contracts. The paper argues first that platforms rule books indeed could be interpreted as relational contracts because they display most of the characteristics that common law ascribes to the concept of relational contracts. The paper submits that if uh, platform rule books are construed by the courts as relational in nature when interpreting them, the courts would seek to imply terms that will sustain the business relationship, terms such as good faith, and prevent parties from frustrating the logic of long-term payoffs. Nonetheless, there are still limitations of the interpretive approach. First, parties will need to rely on a court's assessment uh, and evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis whether each rule book is relational or not, therefore uncertainty remains. And second, the meaning of good faith is also uncertain as uh, it will be interpreted differently in its particular circumstance. Therefore, the interpretive approach remains suboptimal in finding the right balance between the competing needs of the parties for certainty and flexibility for the governance of international trade platforms. Second, the contract design approach suggests that rule books should be designed as relational by their drafters. The paper suggests that parties could incorporate into the corpus of the contract certain elements, including an explicit commitment of the parties to collaborate, an express duty of good faith, uh, a duty of loyalty to the network, and other similar open-ended terms and guiding principles to ascertain the meaning of good faith through proxies. The benefits of this approach are obvious. Parties know that they need to perform in good faith during contractual performance, and they can also establish contractually what good faith means to them and to their relationship. The consequences would be that courts would be able to determine obligations not expressly included in the contract. That way, uh, this uh, help parties to remedy the incompleteness of contracts by outlining indeterminate performance obligations, which are uh, nonetheless legally enforceable. Second, uh, the guiding principles can provide effective protection from the holder problem as good faith binds platform providers to abstain from conduct, which would be regarded as commercially unacceptable by reasonable and honest people. That is the definition of good faith under English law. And thus they strike a balance between predictability and flexibility, as they also provide simplicity in the contract design to encourage the onboarding process. In that sense, they also facilitate legal interoperability between uh, um, as uh, among platforms, as they enable multi-homing without requiring uh, prospective members to face excessive legal transaction costs for due diligence and negotiations of overly prescriptive rule books, such as those of TradeLens or uh, Polero. So the conclusion is that the contract design becomes a transnational regulatory mechanism. And to sum up the contribution of the working paper, First, it has respect, respectfully responded to seminal literature 
declaring the normative meaninglessness of uh, non-currency applications of blockchain technology by providing insights from the container shipping sector where commercial innovators have engineered real world solutions that harness the potential of blockchain to solve the anti-double spending problem in order to digitalize transport documents of title. Second, it argued that contractual mechanisms govern the transnational use of blockchain platforms at the application layer in commercial practice. Third, it identified limitations of governance through contracts in the field of uncertainty raised by contractual incompleteness and the risk of opportunistic behavior. And finally, it proposed that structuring platform rule books as relational contracts by design can provide an effective principle-based governance mechanism for international trade platforms. So that was all from me. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, Ilias. Um, so we will now uh, invite Hedvig Larka to take the floor. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Gothenburg. And her title is Capital Flight as Creature of Sovereignty, a post-humanist approach to corporate income taxation and the global tax base of Pillar 2. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my name is Hedvig Larka, first year PhD student. I would like to first say how grateful I am to be here and to listen to my brilliant co-presenters. I feel like the things that I'm going to say today share certain themes with what you, Alexandra, and what you, Ilias, have talked about today. And maybe we'll come back to that in the Q&A session, which I'm looking forward to. So, as you heard uh, Jamie saying my title there, very long and very complex title, well, I'm not going to dwell in the theoreticals of today. It is difficult enough that we are moving in a field of tax law. Since tax law has not really made itself a place within uh, international law, it hasn't emerged to the level of international law yet. So many say that there is no international tax law. But through the development that I'm going to describe today, there might very well be international tax law in only a couple of years. So I would like to uh, say also that if any of you find what I'm talking about interesting, you watching, you at home, please do not hesitate to send me an email because as a first year student, I am absolutely looking for community. So today I'm talking about corporate income tax law, the taxation of large multinational business and how change is enacted within harmonized regimes of corporate income tax law. Specifically, I'm looking at the global top up minimum tax that is currently administered and installed by the OECD and G20 countries. So these are historical and groundbreaking developments that are ongoing right now, where the model legislation for top-up minimum taxation was released by the OECD only last winter. And I'm looking at this global top-up minimum tax as a form of agency, enacting change within regimes of corporate income tax law. And more to the point, as a mode of state form as agency, as it is understood in this paper. And hopefully this will all be become clear in just a moment. I hope that you all see my presentation. Yes, I can see some notes and it makes me very happy. So why is it important and what is state form? Well, to start with, within regimes of corporate income taxation, there are two groups that can be clearly delineated. So we have OECD, OECD countries on the one side and non-OECD countries on the other. And this, 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 uh, these groups can be shown by how OECD countries enjoy a tax base that is twice as large in relation to their GDP as does non-OECD countries. So it's a difference from 30% in relation to GDP at OECD level and then on average amongst non-OECD countries, 15%. So we can see that the regimes as they are in place today are already heavily biased 
to the favor of OECD countries. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about what is tax law. I hope there is some basic knowledge, even though it's not a part of international law. But to just paint up a heuristics that is commonly used within tax circles, where OECD countries represent the interests of residence states, because they, they rely on categories of residence taxation. So just remember this word. And then we have non-OECD countries that represent the interests of source states. And these two projects, residence states projects and source states projects, they are active at the same time right now, trying to wrest control over how corporate income tax regimes of tomorrow, how a multilateral treaty, for example, might be formulated. And this is where state form is needed. Because we need state form to be able to understand, to, to see, to map and to analyze these projects as what they are. Material projects of legislation and other measures enacted to push the boundaries of the central categories that make state form. And that when we see a multilateral treaty, if we see it, it will mirror the agency of state form as it looks already today. So this is a central argument of my paper. That state form exists only to the extent allowed for by harmonized categories. So we're moving from territory to form. We're stepping away from the idea, ideas of, for example, the sovereign as authority over a territory, levying taxes on their population, for example. We're not looking at that. That is beside the point. That is another story. We're instead looking only at form. And within corporate income taxation, this can mean, for example, that tax sovereignty exists only to the extent allowed for by the harmonized global categories of corporate income taxation. Furthermore, this means that state form as agency is fully determined by the existential drive towards expansion of central categories. Now, this is a contradictory drive, a violently contradictory drive where we have diff different projects fighting to wrest control over the formulation of the same harmonized regimes. So it's a sort of tug of war within the regimes trying to tilt the categories in one's... Um, yeah, so that it works for the group states. Yeah. And within tax law, this translates to, as I already touched upon, that we have these categories of resident states that are represented by the OECD countries trying to push the categories of residence taxation. On the other hand, we have these non-OECD countries relying on and pushing the categories of source taxation. And these categories are contradictory so that the one grows at the cost of the other. Finally, we can see that the struggle that's within state form transcends the limit between private and public, between sovereignty and political economy. So we cannot see sovereigns as apart from the political economy. Rather, the larger struggle of formulating, you know, the laws of the markets, the laws of competition, it's through this larger struggle that the category of corporate income taxation and tax sovereignty with them iteratively emerge. So, this that I have here is a narrative that I get when I talk to co-workers, friends and family, and also when I read OECD deliverables and many academic papers. 
And this is a narrative that says that states, individual states, compete among each other over tax revenue and economic substance on this sort of platform of political economy and thereby eroding their own sovereignty through this competition. And in this narrative, tax havens, for example, are normally starred as, as the villains, you know, tax, tax havens that take advantage of sovereignty in order to erode it. And this narrative ends that with that international tax cooperation is needed to re-establish sovereignty, like across the board. Now with global form analysis, we cannot think like this anymore. Instead, we must see that the global and legal infrastructure that enables tax competition must have been installed in the interest of state form itself. Because we're not looking at individual states we are looking at state form and the eternal cat struggle of state form over centralized categories. And from this perspective, international tax cooperation, maybe multilateral treaty, binding uh, dispute resolution, will mark the reorganization of state form. And the globe top-ups minimum tax will mark a reorganization of state form. redrawing sovereign boundaries. So for example, the last hundred years, when we, if we go back to corporate income taxation, we've seen as regimes of global corporate income taxation are growing into place, that source taxing rights have been pushed down over time steadily and that the residence taxing rights, the residual tax of resident states, have expanded. So we've seen these categories being reordered over time and that this, and this is my argument, the global top-up minimum tax is just another step in this process that have been ongoing for a hundred years. So with all this in mind, let us look at the global top-up minimum taxation. And we're going to look at a specific part of it, which is its creation of a global common consolidated tax base. So what is global top-up minimum taxation? Well, it is a top-up tax, which means that it is levied after the fact, after the base eroding practices and profit shifting of large multinational business have already occurred. So you have this loophole ridden regime today, and then you install the globe top up minimum taxation afterwards on top of this regime. And this is done, this is made possible through a lot of different mechanisms that we don't have time to go into today. But one of the mechanisms is to create a first of its kind common consolidated global tax base. And it is on this global tax base that taxes will be levied within global top-up minimum taxation. And this tax base in turn defines which taxes are covered and which are not covered. And what does this mean? Well, for example, ha here you have a part of the definition of permanent establishment that I um, that was uh, from the globe top up minimum taxation model rules that were released by OECD last winter. And here you see that it defines permanent establishment in a certain way, and permanent establishment is a key concept for source taxation. And the project that we see now from countries such as uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, who all said no to the global deal in which global top of minimum taxation was part, are pushing the categories of source taxation. They are their own projects, you know, that is 
ongoing. And through the, this tax base, through not, through saying that these expanded categories of source taxation are not covered, the profits that are taxed by countries expanding source taxing rights effectively risk getting double taxed at headquarter level, thus harming the countries that have tried to expand source taxing rights. So this globe top-up minimum tax, it has come from uh, over 10 years of negotiations of how to deal with the base eroding practices of multinationals, and these negotiations have been held at OECD G20 level. And around 2000, uh, in the late, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, the OECD collected the inclusive framework of 140 countries to try to design a new way to tax cor corporate income in the future. And there was a lot of hope that we could come together and, you know, take this loophole ridden regime and throw it in the dustbin of history and bring up something new. And that we could tax profits where value was created. Instead, as we see now, the main thing to come out of these negotiations is the globe top-up minimum tax. And it does a lot of things. A lot of things have been written, in, written about it. But today we have focused on what the global common consolidated tax base does. And it marks a reordering of the agency of state form. So it intersects in a material manner within the change that is occurring right now on a global scale within harmonized categories of corporate income taxation and enacts change in this field. And it does so in conflict with other projects, with the project of source states. So, what we see now is that OECD is not bringing international cooperation. OECD is instead bringing a project that is in contest with another project. And that this other project of source taxing states to expand categories of source taxation is not fringe unilateral measures occurring outside of international cooperation as it is discursively constructed. But it is another fully legitimate project aimed at also trying to affect change within state form. So, in conclusion, as we see now that informal, informal governance gives way to international cooperation within corporate income tax law, what is achieved is a cementation of state form. It is the loss of agency of state form. That this contest going on within state form between different projects are being thinned, you know. And that as this happened, it is important for us to acknowledge that which could be or that which could have been to see and to be able to map these legislative measures and other measures as what they are, namely attempts to affect central categories of corporate income taxation. And it is by centering tax sovereignty as form and sovereign agency as form determined that we as international law researchers can approach and untangle global fields of law that are unguided by binding international norms. So with this, I say thank you, and I am much looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Hedvig. Um, so 
that concludes the, the formal presentations. Um, but I hope that there will be some discussion on the back of this. I mean, they, they, are, they were quite diffuse presentations in some way, um, but if there's a unifying factor, is that I think they were all tinged with optimism and may, maybe a bit of hope. And uh, that's really quite something in this day and age when a lot of discussions we have about international law tend to be bleak and depressing. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, I mean, the, all three uh, pan, uh, panelists, I think, may gave us some very rich insights and a lot of food for thought. But I, I'll invite them now to reflect on perhaps what, what other panelists have said, if there's anything that, that they want to pick up on. Um, and in no particular order necessarily, but, um, I, you know, if, if, does anyone want to jump in at this point? Well, I can jump in then. Yeah, please. <laughs> well, I was really excited to uh, hear about your uh, papers, Alexandra and Ilias. And uh, I have a question for each of you. So Ilias, uh, what I found very interesting in your paper was the explanation of how the, the, the actions of participants uh, it is from the actions of participants on market actors and the courts and that decide on how this law is being unrolled and i wonder i wonder who who are the drivers of this change is it the market participants like the sellers and, and buyers and the platform providers uh, and is it also the courts or who are you aiming your paper at? So this is a question for you, Elias. I hope you understood it, even though, you know, post-presentation it came out a little, <laughs> you know. But Alexandra, I, for you an open question, after we have seen COVID and the, uh, what's happening in Ukraine right now, and we have seen how the governance and international law mechanism in place have played out, and also how sovereignty is in tension with these uh, mechanisms. What do you see going forward? What are the lessons from this? What are, your, what are your takes from the developments as they have looked? And what is needed in the future? Thank you. Elias, do you want me to, to jump in first? Or do you want to jump in? Or? Hey, there is fine, uh, but uh, please uh, go ahead. All right. So I, you know, I think what I would, what I expect, and what I would like are different things. So I would like to say that you know we will learn from, especially the pandemic, and now everyone's kind of concerted reactions to um, certainly the nuclear threat. And I, I think it, it's important to when we're talking about um, the the situation in Ukraine. It, kind of delineate the nuclear threat as in, in many ways a turning point um, because we did see such a really fractionalized um, and factionalized UN certainly until that point and then it really did seem to coalesce once that language and rhetoric was was amped up. Um, I would like to see that being brought together to make us all realize that we do need a stronger um, respect for certainly international organizations as part of domestic law as well and understanding of what they are and how they interplay. Um, do I necessarily think that will happen? Probably not. Um, and I think it will be a, really a question of context. Does it stay in Ukraine? Does it expand out? If it expands out, then I think we will see much more of an understanding from a domestic legal perspective of what international organizations are and how international governance can help or harm, hopefully help more. Um, the national perspectives and the way that nations respond to emergencies. If it stays in Ukraine, if it stays something that's very much, unless you are unfortunately Ukrainian um, or in one of the main receiving countries for, for refugees, kind of over there or pocketed or somewhere where you don't have to deal with it on a daily basis, I think we do run the risk of not learning a great deal and not being able to, um, to adapt 
organizations accordingly and adapt the way that we view governance accordingly. Because we do see, obviously, with the pandemic, you know, even though we do have calls for a treaty, even though we do have calls for reforms of the IHRs, even, you know, which guide how we would respond in the future, they're still starting to become a little bit more speculative and a little bit less uh, intense now that we are moving into a more normalized version of you get the booster every six months, every year, and then we, you know, we have some type of mask issue or we don't, but then we try to normalize and move on. Um, I think that, that that scary moment is the moment when we have crystallization of where governance is and how valuable it is. And then as soon as the fear starts to decrease, we start to risk slipping back into normal, um, which is unfortunately going against the hope that Jamie had highlighted coming in. But, you know, but it is very much the reality is like, what do you do with that, that moment of fear and panic? Do you, can you convert it? Or is it just a moment where you, you have it, you address it and then you move on? Ilias. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Hedwig, for uh, your question. So I, I would, um, I think that uh, your question can be deconstructed into uh, different uh, sub questions. The first one is um, more of a, the theoretical context of the paper. So it is indeed, as you have uh, stated, in the sphere of private ordering mechanisms. So um, there is uh, the legis national legislation at the moment does not recognize uh, trade documents uh, in a digital form. It stipulates that these documents need to be in paper form, otherwise they are something else. And we have this private ordering mechanisms, multilateral contracts transcending many countries, and they agree among the signatories of this uh, rule book that for them, uh, electronic records are the legal equivalent of um, paper records. So why is this important? When uh, in some of the platforms that I discussed in the case study, so for example, in the TradeLens platform, six out of uh, the top 10 containers operators by capacity participate, which means that 60% of all containers uh, is uh, um, transported by these six companies in the world. And these six participate there. So we can see the private actors essentially create law. And however, my, my paper is more applied. I'm uh, uh, suggesting realistic solutions in the field of contract law. Your comment is, is very welcomed and it is definitely an avenue for future research. So what are the, the theoretical, uh, let's say, uh, repercussions of this private order and mechanism? And there is rich literature on this topic in, uh, as a source of commercial law, let's say. Uh, and the, it's something that I will likely explore in the future because I'm also in my PhD in my second year, and uh, it's uh, definitely something I am considering. Now, regarding the other part of the question, to whom my recommendations my recommendations are being addressed? Uh, well, I'd say first of all to drafters of this contract, so how they could draft the contract. This means um, so in the paper I explain how these uh, contracts are being drafted, but. Uh, uh, all of the participants have uh, uh, sometimes um, a say in the negotiation. Some rule books, uh, the negotiations preceding, for example, one rule book, the Foundation Carrier Agreement of Tradelands lasted one and a half years because they were so um, detailed. And then suggesting the use of some open-ended terms to uh, mitigate this uh, detailed negotiation, ending up with a 200 page contract and having like a, small, a smaller one. Uh, another uh, addressee of my recommendations is the International Chamber of Commerce, which is currently working towards a uniform rulebook to enable legal interoperability among different uh, uh, platforms. So they, they try to create uh, standardization through a uniform rulebook. And uh, this insight that, that these rulebooks are relational can help them in this standardization effort. Now, um, I don't know if that covers your question. I, if yes, I would like to reverse with some uh, perhaps uh, questions for both of you. Um, could I just uh, just pick up on something, Elias, because it relates to your presentation. It's a question that I had when I when you were speaking. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of times about the 
quasi-universality of English law as the, the choice of law in these transactions. And I'm aware there's a certain amount of literature on why, why parties would choose English law over other laws. But what I'm interested in is why, why would parties choose a certain blockchain over another blockchain? I mean, I, I saw that quite a few have chosen to use the Ethereum blockchain. I mean, what is it inherently about one blockchain or another that might um, affect a party's considerations of which one to use? Well, empirical insight suggests that, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, actually, the participants, these are uh, the drivers of this industry are shipping lines, let's face it. They, they are, it's a concentrated market and uh, like 80% of all uh, containers are shipped by the top 10 carriers. So it's a concentrated market. So the shipping uh, lines are the drivers of the market who will decide eventually with whom they will collaborate. And my empirical insight suggests that uh, they do not care that much about the underlying technology, but uh, the systems that I presented here are the seven systems that have been approved by the International uh, Group of PN Protection and, and Indemnity Labs. These are mutual insurance in the shipping sector. So uh, they have been approved and for any, uh, let's say, risk that uh, will occur due to the risk of blockchain, which would not have been, uh, which would not occur with the use of paper document, there is cover for, for all this. So this is a very important uh, factor for them. And we have seven systems. And now I, I'm uh, in the process of understanding why to choose one system and not another one. Definitely, the use of blockchain uh, is a factor which um, encourages uh, the industry to adopt it because we have electronic solutions like the first two of the table, which are cloud-based in the form of a registry model. So we have a, a registry, a simple registry who register who is the who has possession of the electronic record at its point of time have been available since 1990s, but they have not been adopted uh, in the industry. But now with blockchain, we see the industry actually adopting these uh, these platforms. So the use of blockchain, uh, my friend suggests that uh, definitely spurs digitalization. Now, the nuances between different blockchains, I don't think that uh, uh, they are very uh, the first concern for, for, for the industry. The industry cares more about the contractual solution. As I said, this is the contribution of the paper that it doesn't care about, that the industry does not care about the technicalities of the blockchain because essentially it is not governed by the coders or the miners or the other participants in the blockchain ecosystem, but in essence by contractual means. So they care about the contract, whether it has been approved by uh, um, the PNDI clubs, and uh, what the contract says, if the platform provider undertakes to um, take responsibility for losses, etc. Sorry for. Okay, the, the, I mean, the PNI clubs obviously do care, and I suppose they will have made a decision based on a on a risk assessment. And and it'd be very interesting, I think, as your research evolves, to see why the PNI clubs have chosen one blockchain over another, and whether they're going to be producing any literature on this, or maybe you're going to have to speak to people behind the scenes. But either way, it's an extremely interesting project. And um, you, you said you had some questions for, the, for your co-panelists. Yes, yes, indeed. So um, it's, it's not very sophisticated, but to Dr. Harrington first, uh, the question was, while I was reading your paper, I was wondering whether you would make at some point a comparison between the response to COVID as an emergency and the response to climate change as an emergency in order to, to perhaps make a point like uh, that in COVID, the response was, uh, it didn't take uh, a plan up to 2050 to, to implement, it was uh, straight away, but we do not have the same in climate change. And if you see any, any value in this comparison, I know it's not exactly what you discuss in the paper, but uh, I was expecting to see something about it and I'm not sure what would be your answer to that. Yeah. And to, to Hedwig, my question would be, for, regarding the theoretical background of your paper, so I was uh, very, you use a lot the, the, the term uh, relational uh, 
um, that, that tax sovereignty is relational. And I used in my presentation relational contracts as a legal concept in English contract law. So I, I was very interested to see different uh, meanings of this word. And um, in the paper, you, you, you mentioned that uh, you essentially recast tax sovereignty as relational by a post-humanist reading of Marxian, Marxian capital relations. And that was I didn't really get it at all in the paper because I'm not an expert in the field, not in tax law, not in uh, um, Marx and capital uh, theory. So I was expecting to hear a little bit more about it in the presentation, uh, but I sense that you went straight to the more practical stuff, more about the outcome, which was, again, very interesting. And uh, I could take the essence of the, your presentation. So it was very nice. but. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about it if, if, if you want to explain it. Thank you. So I'll just, uh, I, I think we, we don't need, or we didn't think that we would need a, um, a temporal connection to the idea of how we respond to the pandemic, except quite quickly and, you know, as, acutely as necessary given the the health issues um but what i do think is that we have to separate within the idea of responding to the pandemic as the initial health crisis versus responding as to it as all of the cascading issues that come from it that i talk about a bit more in the paper um, because those issues are often incorporated into the other plans so into the ndcs into the voluntary national contributions or national reports under the um, sustainable development goals it, in a lot of different national reporting systems as well. So I think that we do have to separate out um, the, the various types of timeframes and that the initial emergency of COVID was of a different nature, obviously than climate change. Climate change requires a really phased response in a way that at least public health responding to a um, an emergency of a COVID type or a, a pandemic type doesn't necessarily allow for, um, or at least that balance between public policy and public health concerns and the need for governments to seem responsive and to do something um, doesn't allow for. So when we see it as much more of kind of a pushing out of the timeline from the immediate impacts, longer term, then we start to understand that there really is more of a nuanced understanding that it will take longer. We have legal and regulatory regimes that have been created to respond and are continuously kind of being created and recreated to respond to it. Um, but they don't respond to what most people think of as pandemic response measures, which were masks, PPE, border closings, et cetera, for that very short period of time. Um, so that would be my response, but it's, it's a great point. It's an excellent point. Um, so thank you. And Hedvig, I will pass over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, as you noticed, Elias, I, I did not talk about that because it would be overly complicated. And in a way, we all as lawyers speak about uh, form always. It's always a part of our of our work. So the thoughts that I presented must be maybe uh, defended through the whole theoretical apparatus. And I've been working with Marxian readings and post-human readings, and I'm you know experimenting. And uh, but it can be pre presented without these theories. Well, but now I'm going to explain it. So I also noticed the likeness between our papers, you know, the focus on the relational development of law. And I feel that, yes, there was, you know, some likeness in how we wrote our papers. Because you describe how there are, have been centralized, you know, registers for a very long time, but it hasn't been used because what is needed is this flexibility and this response that is provided this this, this yeah thank you for nodding <laughs> these immediate responses that are provided by by um, blockchain technology within the flow of information so 
and all of the participants that steer these, these developments that you were writing about, they work maybe not as actors, but as relations themselves. Now, going into my project, you know, this is not something, I don't know what you think about this, but because all of these actors, they want to make as much money <laughs> as, as they can, right? And what post-human theory and Marxian theory does to me, and what social form theory, which is the theory that I landed in in this essay. So the title has been changed. And what this does for me is that I can look at an agency enacting change that is not human, that is not within the human, but within the capital relation. So an agency enacted by the drive of capital to accumulate itself. So this is a whole different perspective that is allowed for me through the theory of social forms. Does that explain it? This is uh, yeah, very interesting. And, and uh, you know, just Hedvig, just to, to pick up then on, on where you left just now. Um, so the idea then of, uh, of sovereignty, which you touch on a few times, and I mean, you, you also mentioned the sort of network of, of tax havens, and there's obviously a question of the, the race to the bottom here. At some point, it's very difficult to achieve any kind of global consensus when you may have certain actors who in some cases their, their whole developmental and economic model may, may depend on this, when they say in the case of some small territories. Um, you know, just asking them to to change their standards somehow. Um, I mean, do you have any reflections on the the role that that sovereignty might have, say, in the because as you, as you know, many of the many of offshore tax havens are actually not states in their own right. So they are they are overseas territories of say the, the UK or the Netherlands. Or the, so there's sort of layers of of sovereignty and the, and the interests of these small territories may not be completely aligned with the interests of the parent state. You know? And so you have a, a, there's an issue recently where the UK is, is requiring overseas, its overseas territories to implement public registers of beneficial ownership, um, which some of, some of the overseas territories like the British Virgin Islands are, are very unhappy about. Um, do you have any, any reflections on that um, context? Yes, thank you very much for that question, Naomi. So, to start off, uh, as you say, tax havens are often territories, and the biggest tax haven, if you look at the tax haven registry released by Tax Justice Network, are uh, states that belong to the OECD G20 country spectrum. So we have this idea of a tax paradise, you know, with palm trees and all of that stuff. But it's not true. The tax havens are in the global north, so to speak. And this is important to start off with. And rather on focusing on how these tax havens exploit sovereignty in order to, to uh, you know, to, to win, to gain themselves. I focus on the harmonized forms globally because it is these forms that make possible tax havens. So I take a step back and I ask, how can tax havens be? And the answer to that question is that we have a loophole ridden regime that is harmonized to the extent that bilateral tax treaties worldwide are identical to an extent of 80%. So it's heavily harmonized. And this regime allows, actively allows, from my perspective, for about 40% of multinational profits to go untaxed every year. So the focus is not this time on the tax haven, maybe on the tax haven as part of a project from the perspective of OECD countries and residence countries in the you know, tax lingo. Rather, the perspective is on who is forwarding, pushing, and forming these loophole-ridden regimes. You know, and as global taxation comes, we can see that it is obviously possible. It seems that it is possible to tax these profits, but it hasn't been done. So, 
by not taxing profits as residence level and installing a, a, club, you know, a, a tax regime where OECD countries rely mainly on labor and consumption for, for their tax base, and by not sharing information on tax matters with the rest of the world, and by always throughout history working against attempts from non-OECD countries that try to implement unitary taxation instead of the separate entity principle that is in place today. Through all these measures, we have seen that OECD countries have actively been pushing a regime that is loophole ridden. And this is the focus. I'm sorry it took so much, but I, I like that question, so I had to answer properly. No, it's, it's really a, a fascinating insight, and I, I would just, you know, pick up on what you said. I mean, I completely agree with what you said about this being sort of driven by these important sort of uh, centers in the global north. And at the same time, though, these the, the, the sort of spider web networks of, of offshore territories, I mean, they're not just a feature of the, the design, I suppose, that these, these territories to some extent have agency as well. And, and it is interesting to observe that um, it, it's not simply a question of things being directed from from the center, um, and so there there are sort of many many intricate layers here, and and much more that could be said, I'm sure. But you know, we're going to move to um, the, the the questions from the floor, if, if we may, uh, and you know, some of these I think we, they have been covered to some extent, um, <clears throat> but I'll pick up on. Um, Professor Marie Claire Cordonier Seger's uh, question, which is is quite broad and should uh, maybe sort of give you give you some food for thought, maybe to, to spin off on. So uh, Marie Claire asks: um, Each of you have highlighted the need for change, solutions, and international rules, either through evolution or abrupt transformation. What do you think are the most important pressure points for the change you seek? And do overarching global policy goals to which you can appeal to gather support help or hinder your efforts? So who wants to have a go at that one? So I'll be happy to, to go and start on that. Um, and hello, Mary Claire. It's lovely to know you're out there. Um, so I think that this is a really important point in many of our discussions because the other risk of certainly from from my perspective the other risk of you know, having a biodiversity governance regime and law and a climate um, change system parallel system that they do acknowledge each other they do work together but they also have kind of a competing or overlapping areas that they both try to regulate in um can be understood as as really challenging and it can be understood as a very potentially dangerous efforts to have duplicate um, topics, to have address duplicate forms of concerns in ways that could clash with each other. And I think what we've seen from the pandemic certainly is a number of these types of um, responses coming out in the very immediate um, rapid onset situation where we have multiple countries trying to enact trade reforms so that they can keep PPE inside of their borders, for example, and not have it be exported when they need it at home. We have a number of different states trying to restrict agricultural uh, exports and imports, et cetera, for the same reason. Um, and there often are overlapping jurisdictions there. So we have WHO concerns, we have FAO concerns, we have WTO, it's a whole alphabet soup of concerns. Um, so I think if organized well, if properly discussed, and if we have a governance system, um, which we have started, started to see emerging out of various types of overlapping acknowledgements. So FAO and uh, WHO, for example, working together, um, FAO and ILO, all of these organizations working together, then it can be quite powerful. And then it can allow us to have a very strong um, response to either very rapid or much slower onset emergencies because you do have that network in place. But if you don't have that network, then it becomes much more difficult to have any type of response, but also to make sure that it is not uh, competition-based and that it doesn't um, then start to have a, a public perception that becomes very negative and drives a domestic 
sovereignty based response that can undermine. So it's a challenge. It's a definite challenge. And I think something that going forward, we will have to address much more um, in climate in biodiversity and also in the efforts to kind of build back better and have post pandemic responsiveness, we will, I think, see this a lot more. Um, and the hope then obviously is that we use it as a platform to create stronger organizational um, capacities. But again, that is a hope. So we shall see. Thanks, Alexandra. Anyone else have any reflections on Mary Claire's question? Well, I can start then. Yeah. Okay, so Hedvig and then Ignatia. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for this question. It's a great question. And regarding pressure points, for me, it would be this relational agency of groups of states, you know, within state form. So these different projects of legislation and other measures that are carried out right now, these are the pressure points. It's a decentralized doing of the future of corporate income tax law. And within this conflict that is ongoing, we have the OECD representing, above all, the interests of the OECD states. And then we have other regional organizations, like, for example, the, uh, the African Tax Administration Forum that releases model legislation on how to design digital service taxes. And other regional forums like, for example, a lot of countries coming to go together today and calling for the UN to be established as a formal tax body to govern these changes that are currently ongoing. I hope that gives a question, uh, an answer to my, your question. Yes. Yes. So regarding the pressure point, I think with respect to, to my working paper was mainly the pandemic. So in the pandemic, um, there was an actual need for the industry to digitalize because there were dis disruptions in couriers, paper documents could not travel around the world so easily. So the industry needed to digitalize. The problem to that was that the absence of legislation so uh, with respect to that, there are law reform initiatives, national law reform initiatives. I mentioned earlier the, the uh, Law Commission of England and Wales uh, magnificent work on, on this uh, uh, topic. Um, but uh, it's, uh, international trade is uh, inherently uh, international, transnational. So you need some degree of harmonization between uh, uh, different countries. And uh, here you need a transnational solution, which, well, one may argue that that would be a, an international convention recognizing um, digital documents of title. But the problem here is that the, the documents which have not been able to be digitalized uh, by the traditional internet are documents of title. So they have this uh, trait that they also transfer uh, property rights that would be either ownership or possession of, of uh, goods, um, which uh, complicates uh, matters because it is very difficult to harmonize property law among different countries. And here where rule books come to provide a contractual solution, but again, some limitations to that um, due to the property law conundrums remain. So that, that would be my, my overall answer to, 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 to this question. If, that makes sense. And thank you. Okay, thanks. I mean, I, I think there's a, there was another question for you as well, Elias, which was um, from David Joseph Alieu. I mean, how would, so how would individual countries be affected in terms of global trade? Is there anything in addition to what you've already said that you would like to add in that respect? Yes, so uh, there have been uh, like uh, estimations and research that uh, estimate specific benefits from digitalization. That is a, a fact. Um, now for individual countries, what, uh, uh, what's happening is that uh, we see in various parts of the world, law reform initiatives to implement uh, legislation which is aligned with the ANSI trials model on electronic transferable records 2017. Uh, and 
if uh, at some point there is a, a sufficient implementation of this model law, the blockchain and the digitalization can, can become a reality much more easily. But in terms of, of practical implications, um, there are statistics that uh, say a specific uh, how, how much uh, uh, digitalization can reduce processing of paper documents, what kind of efficiency gains um, it will bring, and um, et cetera. It will, for example, uh, globally, it will increase uh, the volume of global trade by 43% in uh, 2019, va 2019 values by 2026. This is the, the estimation of the International Chamber of Commerce um, in uh, their uh, paper making the case for law reform. So yes, there are uh, th there, there are some some outputs regarding this in terms of numbers. Have there been any recent uh, interesting cases of dispute settlement? Well, no, and that's uh, one thing that I mentioned in the paper that uh, because there have not been any case and the transition from the paper medium to the digital medium uh, essentially removes all the legal certainty which is uh, um, attached to the paper medium regarding disputes. Uh, this creates uncertainties indeed, and this is perhaps uh, uh, something that prevents some parties from digitalizing. I haven't been able to find uh, one, to be honest. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so does anyone else have any, uh, any comments, reflections, questions? Well, I, I accidentally marked uh, uh, someone asking for my email as answered, and I'm sorry about that, George. <laughs> uh, okay. So- uh, Did, did they, they have a substantive yeah. question as well? No, I'm no. sorry about that. So I'm just saying that my email's in the chat. No, that's fine then. Um, so un unless anyone has anything else, then uh, I think we can probably wind up slightly earlier than we otherwise would have. Um, and you know, it just remains for me to thank all three of you for the really fascinating uh, presentations and also for the level of engagement um, with with each other's presentations but and also more generally um i think it's been a really stimulating panel um so thank you all and i'll, I'll pass over to um jameson now who i guess will just wind up proceedings absolutely so um on behalf of the cambridge international law journal we'd like to thank you all for coming and we hope that you have a wonderful lunch break and then just a quick reminder that after lunch we do have um, our next panel starting so see you later Thank you so much for organizing this. Yes, thank you all. Be well. Thanks Take all. care. Thank you.